program. This uh, program is put on by UWL's Environmental Council and uh, they are sponsoring this program. Uh, I'm excited about it. I've heard uh, Jack speak on uh, public radio and in other venues and so it's nice to finally have him uh, here in La Crosse and to share with us what he has learned about orga organic farming. So uh, with little ado, I will turn it over to Jack Hadeen from Featherstone Farms. Thank you very much. Is that a good sound, sound where we want to be? Thanks for coming out. I really am grateful for your interest in this, for the uh, invitation to come speak with you and uh, talk about what I'm so passionate about, which is uh, my farm and uh, my community of people that work with me on our farm and, and our vision of agriculture. Uh, I uh, run a business called Featherstone Fruits and Vegetables, which is located about uh, 30 miles due west of here in southeast Minnesota. Uh, we are certified organic vegetable farmers. We grow fresh market produce for um, food co-ops, a CSA program, and wholesalers throughout the upper, uh, upper Midwest. We began in uh, 1994, my wife and I, my brother, on three rented acres. And uh, uh, we just happened to be in the right place at the right time and, and have grown through the years uh, with the support of great customers and uh, great community people to the point where now we're uh, this year managing about 250 acres of uh, really good farmland, about 120 of which is going to be fresh market organic vegetables this year and uh, then a lot of other cover crops and uh, soil building uh, uh, plantings that you'll hear me talk about in a little bit. Uh, so uh, once again, I want to really thank everyone on our farm that's helped me prepare for this and that has helped run the farm uh, even as I've been uh, uh, in the office working on all the preparations here. I had, uh, uh, Mike is here from our farm and uh, uh, we may see others come in here. I'm really grateful to everyone uh, that, that we work with. It's just a fantastic uh, crew of people that I'm lucky enough to work with. Uh, the title of my presentation this evening is The Search for Sustainability on One Southeast Minnesota Farm, Our Own. Daily practice and the big picture. And by that I mean I'm going to talk about uh, this, uh, 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 this, this compare and contrast between uh, my own experience on our farm, what we see and experience day by day uh, farming uh, in southeast Minnesota uh, around issues of environmental sustainability with the big picture of sustainability in agriculture, at least as I see it. So I'm going to talk about three things really. I'm going to, I'm going to tell the story of our flood that occurred to us a couple of years ago and what I learned from it and what it means, the lessons to my mind about sustainability. I'm going to talk in general about uh, the scope of sustainability in agriculture on some general level, the big picture, at least as I see it in, uh, in the Corn Belt here. And third and final, I'm going to talk this evening about um, what we're doing at our farm right now, Featherstone Farm, day in, day out, and as we plan and, and prepare for the future to make everything we do way more sustainable. Because it's, this is a, truly one of the uh, real uh, 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 core things for us day by day in, our, in the operation of our farm is pursuit of the sustainability. First, however, I'm going to offer three disclaimers, uh, three uh, 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 quick statements to, to let you know a little bit where I'm coming from here. Much of what I'm going to say this evening is going to be very critical of, of modern agriculture as it's practiced in our area. Uh, but uh, generally, I do not fault farmers for this sort of thing. I uh, do not see them as being reckless or negligent in most cases. Rather, I see farmers, uh, by and large, doing a very good job responding to what we as a society ask them to do, which is to produce lots of calories inexpensively. So if I see a problem in agriculture, I see it as us as the consumers that are, are driving it in this way rather than farmers that are uh, uh, somehow running off with, the, with, the, uh, with this project of agriculture um, and being reckless. Second disclaimer, I do not have all the answers by any means to the questions that I'm posing this evening. Far from it. Uh, what I have it really is just a, a commitment to asking tough questions of myself and of people on our own farm about what we're doing day by day. And I have also a sense of obligation, I feel, to uh, uh, pursue higher uh, answers and higher, uh, set the bar higher in every step of what we do uh, when we find that what we're doing is not sustainable. So uh, again, I, I do not have all the answers. Third and final disclaimer, uh, much of what we do at Featherstone Farm day by day uh, really looks good on the surface. Uh, and in many ways, I'm very, very proud of what we've accomplished and what we continue to accomplish on our farm. 
But for me to suggest that, uh, that what we're doing is the answer in some big sense of the word, that if only all farms would be run just like Featherstone Farm, the world would be a, a, a better place and that, uh, 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 that all these issues of sustainability would just evaporate, far from it. Um, I do not see uh, our farm as being the answer. It's part of, 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 of one person's concept and one group's concept of an answer. But uh, whether it could be capable of being replicated uh, on a scale to where we could feed seven to or nine billion people in the, in the, in the near future uh, without degrading the environment, this is a question that is far beyond me and, uh, and my ability to imagine what such a system would look like. So I do not have all the answers. My goal here in this presentation is not to promote fear or panic in any way. Uh, I don't see the sky falling right this minute. But what I do want to stress is the sense of urgency and the importance of getting started on this project of sustainability, not just in agriculture, our food system in general, and society across the board, because um, uh, the business as usual uh, is not going to be an option for much longer, at least as I see it. And um, I want you to encourage, to encourage you to have the imagination to envision something different, to envision an alternative to this, and to be the change that you want to see in the world, in your daily lives, and to devote yourselves to sustainability in any way that you possibly can, um, uh, because uh, it, again, is, is as a community of people that we're going to come up with solutions to these great challenges that seem to be facing us. So there are the disclaimers. Disclaimers, I'm going to begin, first of all, by telling a little story. And that is, in uh, August of 2007, we received in southeast Minnesota 26 or 27 inches of rain in 36 hours, which is uh, nearly uh, unimaginable uh, amount of rain. It's, you know, in, in general, we get about 32 inches of rain a year in, in, in our neck of the woods. And the flooding, that flash flooding that ensued was uh, so completely uh, unimaginable to any of us before, it essentially erased our farm from the map where we were located on a, uh, on a small piece of land that we'd been renting. Uh, we found butternut squashes five feet up in trees, two miles downstream. We had uh, our machine shop was swamped in uh, two feet of the most rancid uh, backwash and, uh, and, and, and spent motor oil and uh, runoff that you can possibly imagine. The, the experience of that flood was indescribably horrific for us at, 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 in our way of life and, and ended a, a way of farming that, that, uh, that we had been uh, pursuing for the first for 12 years of our business. The story of the flood is more than just a story about heavy rain, however, in my mind. It's very tied into a question of land use because, uh, you know, earlier just two, three months in advance of this, this rain event in August, I had watched neighbors remove a long section of tree line on a steep hillside so they could take their 24-row corn planter across that hill, uh, you know, encouraging runoff uh, on, that, on, on slopes. You know, we see all the time farmers putting in larger and larger drain tiles upstream of us in, the, uh, uh, in our watershed, uh, encouraging water to dry out, to get off of farm fields quicker. Our method of farming right now and, and what we're doing in agriculture is exacerbating these problems that we get with these heavy rains, but that's another story. Uh, what we experienced on our farm here um, it was a, uh, about two weeks of absolute survival mode um, panic. And uh, uh, my farm family, uh, farm crew, family and others uh, ultimately made the decision to move um, from this one area uh, uh, in the Wiscoy Valley of uh, Winona County and, and, and we were so fortunately able to move our entire farm operation eight miles away uh, to drier ground just west of Rushford which you can visit to this day if you come out and ride the bike trail in Rushford you're riding right pa past our place all the time and you're very welcome to look us up we would love to have people out uh, but um, <clears throat> that move to the drier better ground in Rushford was very fortunate because in June of 2008, the heavy rains returned, and Fillmore County was, was declared its second uh, federal disaster inside 10 months. And uh, uh, again, uh, we, we struggled with uh, you know, rain and, and, and water, flood waters and fields. It was really, really a difficult time, again, twice in, in 10 months with this kind of destruction. Um, last year, 2010, uh, was also um, a, uh, an insanely wet year for us. We had uh, persistent rains that made what we do very difficult. And, uh, and then we had two four-inch rains in September, which, uh, which, uh, in which, from which we very narrowly averted a third federal disaster declaration in, in four years. So this, in, these intense rains are really something. And 
of course, they prompt a lot of thinking. You know, what am I learning from all this? How do they influence our thinking about sustainability in agriculture? Well, first of all, uh, it's obvious that our farm is a canary in a coal mine of, of a certain sort here. That uh, what, we're, what we see in our farm is the effects, the early effects of global climate change in the very starkest terms. Because, of course, these intense rain events are precisely what uh, climate change scientists have been uh, predicting for a lot of years, that, that the, uh, that the, the uh, uh, intensity of rains and the destructiveness of rains will, will only continue to grow. And uh, no doubt we are the, 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 uh, the, the canary in the coal mine on this. And we're also, as I discovered, Featherstone Farm at the leading edge of this inevitable collision between uh, the need to produce food, which is uh, modern agriculture really, and the need to protect our fragile environment. And um, we just found ourselves in this very unique position of, um, of, of, of recovering from one environmental catastrophe, but of uh, thinking about how to, number one, insulate ourselves from the next one, and number two, to use our, our story as a way of, uh, of advocating for a different model. And of course, that different model is something which is, uh, you know, can be largely described with a, with a certain sustainability. And that's what I'm going to talk about this evening, that, that sustainability all of a sudden became the key focal point for all that uh, we think and do on our farm day by day uh, as we attempt to become part of the solution rather than complaining about being victims or, or, or being part of the problem. This is the key thing here. Uh, after years and years of this, uh, it, it, after that last foreign train in September this year, I just decided that we're not going to be victims anymore. We're going to become part of the solution. So um, we are uh, uh, becoming strong spokespeople for um, sustainability and everything we do. I took the opportunity of, of, of uh, <clears throat> that third near-miss uh, federal disaster last fall to write an article for the New York Times that was published, um, you know, in which I described uh, our experience of flooding over three years and what I think it means. And uh, coming out of that, I've had an opportunity to speak to a number of different audiences like this one about uh, what we've experienced and where we see it fitting into the big picture of uh, sustainability in the environment. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Let's get behind this. Sustainability in agriculture, I'd like to just uh, make, offer some brief uh, comments and brief definitions. A system of producing crops that does in, in a way that does not degrade the soil, the farm ecosystem, or the broader environment. And I'm going to talk about each of these three in turn. Um, and it's a system uh, of pro producing crops that does not rely on inputs, fertility, energy, any of these sources of inputs that we, that we use in agriculture that are non-renewable. So I set a very, very high bar on this, as you'll see. I, I think that uh, if we're really honest with ourselves, we need to look at a time frame which involves generations, hundreds if not thousands of years, if we're really going to be thinking about what's truly sustainable. Because uh, we need to rely on, on technologies excuse me, technologies, inputs, resources that we have certain confidence are going to be around in, 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 in 20 or 200 or even 2,000 years. Not relying and hanging our hats on, on some uh, hypothetical future of, uh, of, of hydrogen fuel cells or, uh, or, or genetically modified crops that can, can, can fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere uh, as, as, as legume, uh, legumes do. Uh, these things are hopeful. You know, of course, I, I, I'd like to see these things happen, but I think we need to be realistic about the limits that the environment is going to put on us and to come up with a system that deals with those limits in a meaningful way. So <clears throat> this is a system also that at this day and age, in the early 21st century, has to take into account this huge challenge of feeding people and um, the need to minimize uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, to avert uh, you know, uh, global uh, you know, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations in excess of 400 parts per million, which uh, leads, tends toward a future that is, again, unimaginably volatile and, uh, and, uh, and potentially um, uh, 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 difficult for agriculture, to say the least. So again, the quest for sustainability in agriculture is about the tension between the need to produce calories and the need to protect soils and the environment at the same time. This is a huge tension in everything that I do on the farm, and I'm going to talk about this. You know, uh, what I need to do is, is to have a good, clean seed bed for, um, for, for the crops that I'm growing here. I need to be tilling and, and working soils to be able to get a good stand of carrots or, or cabbage or tomatoes with no weeds and, and, and in a way that I can get in there with equipment and, and harvest them. 
This is really uh, in, in great tension with the idea of promoting a healthy, biologically active soil in ways that I'll describe. But again, the most fundamental challenge here is, is the, the, the pressure to feed all these people, which in my opinion inevitably leads to intensive production systems. These types of huge monocultures lacking diversity, which I consider to be very brittle, not resilient systems, and which um, almost inherently lead to this degradation of soil and resources that agriculture itself depends on. Okay, this is the tension about sustainability in agriculture. Because you know, what we want, of course, is, is a stable system, so socially, environmentally, and so forth. Uh, we don't want to have a, a, some sort of a, a collapse of, of, of our ability to produce or feed people that would produce uh, a disarray in, in society. But of course, if we, if we uh, ratchet back from this, this system that does produce all these calories so quickly, uh, you know, we could inadvertently produce the very types of food riots and, and crises that we see all around us in the world uh, in the last couple of years. So again, what I'm going to talk about first is this collection of, of, of my notion of sustainability with soils, sustainability with agricultural resources, and then sustainability in terms of uh, a global climate change in the environment. There are many things that I could talk about as well, water quality, GMOs, uh, uh, the uh, seed uh, uh, sourcing and, and uh, uh, seed plasm. I mean, there are many, many things to talk about with sustainability, but I'm going to talk about three things that I know best. Again, soils, resources, and uh, climate change. So this is a quote that I always take right here. Soil is the tablecloth under the banquet of civilization. No matter what people build on it, when it moves, all the food and finery go crashing. And I think what this author meaning uh, by moving is not earthquakes like we saw in Japan, but disruptions of any sort, physical disruptions, biological, chemical disruptions to soil. And this is the fundamental issue of sustainability. When we till the soil to make long straight beds like these that are on our farm right now, uh, this is an incredibly invasive act, which at its very nature is uh, just is, is undermining the, 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 the complexity of that tablecloth right there, the biological, chemical, physical properties. And again, here's this tension. I want to have a nice field like this that's going to be planted to carrots, and it's going to grow a nice, productive field that I can use to feed people and our customers from uh, throughout the entire upper Midwest here. And I can't do it if it's rough and, and full of weeds and, and, and full of pests and everything. I need to standardize that field to get a good stand. But that is the tension because it's bad for the ground. And anything I can do to avert that kind of problem and create uh, uh, issues like erosion uh, or, uh, or organic matter depletion, anything of that sort, this is my challenge as an organic farmer. Because again, part of the problem is the, the tension between uh, 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 perennial and annual, or the, the, the difference between the root systems, the soil building, the soil holding capacities. This is a, uh, a, a, an annual wheat on the left versus perennial wheat on the right. Look at the root systems of the, of the wheat that feed us day by day in our Wonder Bread, right there. And look at what the perennial wheat ancestors, the root systems of those things look like. And imagine the contribution to building soil biology and soil humus, soil fertility that the, that the perennial system offers us compared to this uh, poor substitute that we have developed in our own agriculture with annual crops. The big picture on soil once again then is that current agriculture is slowly or in some cases very quickly losing or degrading topsoil which is that tablecloth on which the whole banquet is laid and unless we take better care of our soil there's no sense in talking about anything else in sustainability in agriculture. It is absolutely at the root of everything. So what are we doing right now in agriculture? Well, again, we are uh, supplementing uh, fert fertility, the, the chemical and biological processes of the soil, with non-renewable uh, resources like uh, potash being mined, uh, here in this case, in Saskatchewan. This is a non-renewable resource, but it, it, it injected into a farm field, it can produce gl uh, glorious yields for a short period of time. We've got all of our natural, you know, natural gas is the source, again, a non-renewable source here, producing uh, the nitrogen fertilizer that is used to, uh, to boost production in current modern agriculture. Uh, we have, uh, this is the Alberta tar sands. You know, when we fill up our fuel, uh, our, ve our vehicles in, uh, in the upper Midwest here, most of the gas comes from Alberta. And uh, this is what it looks like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of square miles of boreal forest bulldozed to extract uh, uh, tar sands here uh, that produce fuel for us, that fuel our tractors at Featherstone Farm, that fuel our cars as we get around. 
Uh, this is uh, not a sustainable system. And of course, coal-fired power, all things that make our lives at Featherstone Farm much easier, uh, but which are non-renewable and, uh, and, and have to, we have to find alternatives to these things. So again, the big picture on agricultural resources here, current agriculture is surviving on unsustainable loans of minerals and hydrocarbons which are really uh, fundamentally non-renewable. If we're going to talk about sustainability in agriculture, we have to talk about alternatives to these things. So then uh, on the question of climate change here, the third thing that, uh, again, big picture on sustainability. Climate change is one area where agriculture is both a major cause of the problem <coughs> and one of its victims. And uh, as our, our farm has experienced at, uh, it is so dramatically these last few years, it is here, now, it is the real deal, and it threatens at the fundamental level everything that we're doing in our daily work in, in agriculture. You can see here that agriculture directly is, is responsible for 12.5% of all uh, global um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, although indirectly through transportation fuels and uh, land use and, and a whole range of other things, you know, I, I understand that the number could be as high as 25% of all the greenhouse gas emissions globally are generated by industrial agriculture. Um, if, we, if we continue down this path, the, the results are very predictable, and you probably know a lot of them. Uh, when we get above 450 parts per million in atmospheric carbon dioxide, we trigger a series of feedback loops in, in, uh, in, in uh, 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 permaculture in the, in the, across the, the northern hemisphere and in uh, uh, the, the breakdown of, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, phytoplankton in the, o in the oceans and so forth that are going to very rapidly bring us to a six or seven hundred parts per million of carbon, which is an almost indescribably uh, horrific future for human life as we know it. But agriculture can also be a big part of the solution, and this is what we're attempting to do right now, uh, and, and I'll talk at, at great length about just briefly. Composting, creating, so, you know, banking um, carbon through compost or through sod. Uh, or through cover crops on annual ground. Uh, we do a lot of this sort of thing at Featherstone Farm, as you'll see. Agriculture is presently so much a part of the problem, could be so much a part of the solution. So again, the causes of, of global climate change I've talked a little bit about. What are the effects? Well, here, uh, the, the Minnesota state climatologist who I talked to after these events last September Kat has, it sent me this chart here. This is a chart of 1,000-year rain events in southern Minnesota since 2004, and we've had three of them. Three 1,000-year rains in southern Minnesota since 2004. What kind of a future is this going to mean for farms like ours? Uh, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'll be the first to admit, I'm, 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 I'm worried. I'm genuinely worried. How are we going to be able to deal with this, particularly as we accelerate the the, uh, the, 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 the degrading of, 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 of hillsides and, and, and tiling fields and, 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 and focusing those effects on the landscape so much greater. This is, it's, it's a huge challenge for us. Um, and again, not just for us in the Midwest, but we see drought in, the, in, in Russia through in 2010. We see uh, pests like uh, soybean aphids that um, you know, 20, 30 years ago we didn't see in Minnesota, but are now uh, very prevalent and very destructive in, uh, in, throughout our area. Uh, I think in large part because of climate change and, and uh, the, the uh, uh, differences in, in, uh, in winter cycles in particular. And here's a, a thing that just completely astounds me. I talked to, you know, I talked to many conventional farmers in our area. One of them is a very bright young man, 40 years old, he's about my age. He said, Jack, and again, this is a guy that's running thousands of acres of commercial corn. This is not someone that's an alarmist about global climate change. He's not doing one thing on his farm to abate this problem. But he said, Jack, when I was growing up, the Corn Belt was the I-80 corridor, the sweet spot where the, where the right temp combination of temperatures, day and night temperatures, allowed corn to grow best. He said, now, 30 years into my grow career in growing corn, the Corn Belt has moved to the Minnesota-Iowa border, 120 miles north in 30 years. How long can that go on, realistically? Of course, they're still growing corn in Missouri and in, in, in Oklahoma and so forth, but it's much less productive, much more risky. How, how soon is it going to be until we're growing corn in the tundra in northern Canada where there's no soil? How, how long can this go on? When are we going to develop an alternative? 
Okay, so I'm going to talk about the alternative. Um, this, is, uh, this is what we're doing at, at Featherstone Farm day by day. And again, I want to just be very clear. I, this is just one model. This is not the answer. I'm a lot clearer on the problems than I am on how we're going to fix them. But I am determined day by day to, to, to operate our farm in a way that, that tries to get at some of this. <clears throat> what are we doing day by day? We're working on things to build healthy soils and farm ecosystems. I'll talk about this for, for a moment. We're transitioning to renewable sources of fertility and energy wherever possible. We're minimizing our net carbon footprint in a lot of important ways that I'll talk about. And we are thinking and, and envisioning all the time a, a, a real deal, a, a different paradigm, I should say, a different paradigm of long-term sustainability, this Featherstone Farm of the Future. Uh, it's described in a, in a document that I have on the back table you're welcome to take with you uh, at the end of this. But uh, again, it's just uh, uh, one of my, my thoughts on, on how we're going to come up with a better, more sustainable system for agriculture. So I'll take each of those four points in, gen in, in, in turn here. Building healthy soils. Uh, we're working all the time at Featherstone Farm to integrate more perennial and annual cover crops into the rotation. These perennial crops that have such marvelous root systems that, hold, that not just hold soil in place, but renew soil and build soil by the creation of humus, organic matter in that soil right there through that marvelous root zone. I mentioned to you before that we manage 250 acres. Uh, less than half of those acres are in vegetables at any given time of year. The rest are all in, or in, any, in any year, the rest are all in cover crops, perennial cover crops, soil building cover crops. Uh, we have a five-year rotation, two or in some cases three years of that five-year rotation are vegetables. The others are soil building perennial cover crops that have so many um, uh, positive effects but primarily as, 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 soil, as soil builders. Uh, we're working on plans to reintegrate livestock and uh, hooved animals into our rotation, uh, particularly on sod grass uh, like this here. Um, over time, we're going to be acquiring cattle we, uh, this coming year and starting to introduce them into a vegetable rotation as a way of mimicking a natural system whereby uh, hooved animals, you know, as you can imagine in this area, elk and bison and, and so forth, once very prevalent here, building soil through the, uh, the collaboration of flora and fauna. We're using fields and soils more appropriately to avoid erosion. This is an aerial photo of a, of a piece of land that we, a farm that we bought just in October of this year, our first real farm that we purchased since flood re uh, recovery. And I just put it out here to show you there, there this is on the, on the edge of a hillside. This is a very steep hill coming up out of the valley and onto the high ridge. And there are a series of very st steep slopes around here, contour strips. And you can see where the farmers have had erosion in the past here in certain areas. There are washes and, um, you know, where, where, across fields where they're just plowing indiscriminately across here. And uh, so we're working with the NRCS to lay out right now for next year, you know, a series of contour strips where vegetable fields will be laid out in, in, in very uh, different ways in this field to, to, to avert erosion. And, and taking a lot of this hillside land that, that has been uh, farmed for way too long and, and putting it into perennial cover crop or uh, uh, forage for cattle, livestock. And um, uh, uh, planting up here, we're gonna have, have a wonderful orchard up on some of this steep land up here as well. So again, um, uh, using uh, soils more appropriately rather than just indiscriminate plowing across contours. And promoting also diversity of the whole farm ecosystem. We're going to be planting or we're going to be working around a pond right here and planting an insectaries for beneficial insects around this entire region here. When we took over this farm, there was not a flowering tree or shrub or anything anywhere on the property that would attract bee pollinators or beneficial insects, anything. It's corn, it's forage, and it's wasteland. But again, if we can promote diversity by planting an acre of insectaries right here, by uh, out on some of these uh, bluff tops controlling cedars and, and buckthorns and other invasive species to allow a diversity of habitats there. A uh, whole range of things that we're going to be doing to promote diversity and, and, uh, and, and thereby contributing to soil health. Uh, trying to use non-renewables as judiciously as possible. We use them, I'll be honest. You know, we have semi-trucks of mineral coming in from mines in Utah or, or, uh, or, or uh, big pits in Tennessee, uh, uh, peat moss from, from bogs in, in, in northern Canada that's essentially uh, non-renewable. But boy, we are really judicious in their use and we think about uh, trying to find alternatives all the time. 
and then looking into ways of recovering nutrients from, consu uh, from consumers of our crops. It would be nice to have a nice picture here uh, of, of, uh, of us carting off vegetable scrap from a produce department of a food co-op that we sell to in Minneapolis or La Crosse. Uh, we don't have that photo yet because we're not doing it, but we're thinking about looking into these things all the time in ways that we'll be able to recover some of the materials from our customers, uh, compost from, uh, or leaves from, from neighbors and so forth to, to, to turn into compost and, and to reintegrate into our soils to restore that balance of fertility that we rely on so, uh, so heavily. So conservation, okay, so, so that again is that soil and some of the, uh, the, the agricultural inputs. Energy is a huge one here then. Uh, transitioning to renewable energy at Featherstone Farm. Conservation, of course, is the lowest hanging fruit. We're working on things like that all the time. Uh, but we're also transitioning and creating alternative sources of energy all the time. The first is in this wonderful vegetable warehouse we put in a nine ton ground source geothermal system which is uh, in place right now to heat and cool all areas of the warehouse except for the coolers. This is a, a carbon neutral um, heating and cooling system except for the, uh, the electrical current that moves this heat pump here. And, um, and that's always gotten me a little bit, that we're still using a lot of electricity to drive the heat pumps. So then we're looking into alternatives to that. We have good friends in California that have put up a very large photovoltaic array on a uh, machine shop, um, uh, very much like our own. And um, although this is in Sacramento where the sun shines all the time, we have very nearly the same solar resources um, here in Minnesota at the time of year where it matters for our business, which is June through October. And so we are now, uh, it just as of this spring, launching a major uh, capital campaign to raise a quarter of a million dollars or more to cover our new warehouse with a 60 kilowatt photovoltaic array, which will remove our entire um, four acre physical plant, our warehouse, our machine shed, our collection of greenhouses, everything, take it all off the grid and make it all carbon neutral. 6,000 square feet of photovoltaic cells that will be on our shed just like this, knock on wood within a year to, to make this, you know, carbon neutral. Yes? Is your, is your geothermal horizontal or vertical? It's a horizontal, the question is about geothermal, it's a horizontal field. I'll be happy to talk about details of some of these things uh, uh, when we get to question and answer. I'm happy to have your question, uh, but uh, let's, um, I just want to move through. I'm acutely conscious of, 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 of time and, and, and moving right along, but I'd be, I'm glad to talk about it. Um, another, another thing, we're converting more tractors to run on electric. This is Esteban cultivating this very afternoon here in the field. And those of us who are, you know, I, I, we have some farm employees back who are chuckling. Uh, we have this electric tractor run on batteries. It's the first, it, it's one of ten that we have, but we have plans uh, working on converting more of them to run on electric uh, battery power. That, uh, again, here's, this is one of our buildings right here. 6,000 square feet of roof space covered by photovoltaic. We'll be able to charge multiple tractors to run off of the sun, current solar energy, and this is a big part of the solution. Um, and then uh, solar hot water heat uh, for our greenhouses is, again, is in the, is in the near, for, uh, near term future planning. Uh, a, a very uh, cost effective and um, sensible uh, way of, 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 of generating heat um, for our greenhouses, specifically at a time of year in uh, April, May, when uh, the sun, we have a lot of sun, and, um, and, and could be converting that into heat for the greenhouses. Very long term, we're looking at uh, the idea that, you know, if, if we have, again, uh, 120, 150 acres of ground that's not in vegetables in any given year, whether there are perennial, ideally perennial, or perhaps uh, annual cover crops, uh, like this is canola, oh, excuse me, canola here that we could use, we could grow on our farm to create a, a, a biomass for biodiesel to run those other uh, uh, tractors and, and trucks that, that, that we rely on. Again, I think you're getting the picture here that I am setting a very, very high bar for our farm because I don't feel like we have any alternative, quite frankly, uh, looking into the future. From my vantage point as a victim of these floods, we've got to get serious about all aspects and look into every corner, ask every hard question about what we're doing and the sustainability of it all at Featherstone Farm. Um, carbon. What are we doing about carbon? Well, you can imagine many of these things have very similar, uh, you know, there's a lot of overlap. As we build soil organic matter by composting, by cover cropping, by all of these soil building methods that I've been talking about, perennial crops and, 
and uh, organic matter building, we are sequestering carbon. And there's, a, there's real reason to believe that this could be a, an extremely, over time, could be a very meaningful uh, 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 amount of carbon that we could sequester here. I had a long talk with uh, Jonathan Foley from the University of Minnesota last fall, who is the director of the U of M uh, Institute on the Environment. He has a brother in, that runs an organic farm in Maine. And he, John and his brother had been looking very carefully at soil organic matter on his 12-acre um, organic farm in Maine. And they discovered that simply by, and, and again, John Foley is a very vigorous scientist and, and is looking at this not with rosy colored glasses, but on a quali quantitative level and analyzing the amount of carbon being sequestered in these 12 acres in Maine through uh, the, the, the uh, development of organic matter. And he discovered that, um, he's, he plotted this out, demonstrated that, that they've built enough organic matter to wipe out that farm's uh, carbon footprint for 300 years or better in 10 years of soil organic matter building on these 12 stinking acres. So you can see it, you can, you, we've got to take this seriously, right? I mean, if we're serious about sequestering carbon, it's possible. We build organic matter by these processes that, that, that I've spoken about. We, uh, we plant trees and perennial crops and so forth. Uh, tomorrow, although you guys don't know it, the employees here, we're going to pick up a bunch of trees in Preston, our first couple hundred trees for that Peterson farm that I showed you about there. And we're going to be planting them in windbreaks, but also for carbon sequestration. We're going to be uh, using less energy. We're using it from, 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 from carbon neutral sources, from carbon neutral sources. Essentially, we're doing everything we can to minimize the carbon footprint that we, uh, 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 that we uh, create each day in our daily operations at Featherstone Farm. So I want to talk about one final thing here before I conclude, and that is, again, this, this big vision of agriculture. I, I, again, I think I've been talking on a pretty big level here so far about what we're doing. We're uh, hopefully raising that bar very high, but nevertheless, um, there are all these other issues that I, I, I haven't talked about. You know, the fact that we're still growing 95% industrial hybrids that are uh, being produced, seed that's being produced in uh, Indonesia or Chile or the Philippines. And uh, we're relying on, on uh, a Chilean nitrate from a handful of caves, you know, in, in, in islands off the coast of Chile. You know, we're, we're far from being sustainable. We don't really produce still all that much of what we consume, what we rely on day to day on our farm. But the answer to it, to my mind, is this, this, this idea of the Featherstone Farm of the future. And this is something I wrote in July of 2006, way before the flood. But uh, again, I've been a big picture thinker for a lot of years in this. There are copies of this in the back if you'd like to see it. But ultimately, uh, the, the idea of this farm of the future is to create a farm within a farm. To use the success of our existing uh, uh, industrial organic uh, 21st 20th century model of organic vegetable production, as good as it is, we're going to use the success of that to try something qualitatively different, um, which is a farm within a farm, 10 or 15, 20 acres within our 250 that are operated along through a completely different paradigm in agriculture. And you can read about it, I won't go on and on, but again, being uh, sustainable at an even more fundamental level. Because once again, um, from what I've seen in my experience of farming, the soil loss, the, the crazy weather events, uh, these trucks semi -tra load after semi load of stuff rolling into our farm from who knows where, the fuel bills, all of it, how long can business continue as usual? This is my great grandfather sitting on a, a harvester in the early part of the 20th century. And um, in his memoir, published during the Great Dust Bowl, my great-grandfather, which I have right in my hands here, wrote a great deal about early frontier life in southeast Minnesota. He wrote about uh, sod houses and hunting and trapping, fishing. He wrote about the con community of Scandinavians that settled in Featherstone Township uh, of Goodyear County near Red Wing, about 120 miles north of here. This is the township which uh, from which our present farm derives so much of its inspiration and so much of its, uh, well, its very name, as a matter of fact. Above all, my great-grandfather wrote about early agriculture of the region. His experience is plowing up the high grass prairie with the one-bottom moldboard plow. He wrote about seeing the first seam threshers come to the prairie, 
in the late latter part of the 19th century. But my great-grandfather was also a very keen naturalist. He was an observer of soil and woods and prairie of the environment. And he saw the direction in which agriculture was moving, even at the conclusion of the 19th century. He saw that we were moving in a direction in which, again, the need to produce at that time wheat and, and calories from the, 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 the environment would inevitably lead to a collision of uh, values between, again, production and sustainability, conservation of resources. Like me, he was also a very ambitious farmer, and uh, by, the, by the 1920s, he was managing nearly 500 acres, which at that time would have been almost unimaginably large farm. But like me, a century later, my great-grandfather saw his farming practices as part of the problem as well as part of the solution. And he devoted his life in some way to reversing this tide of environmental degradation. And his work remains a huge inspiration to me to this day. I'd like to read to you a very short excerpt from this autobiography, or this not autobiography, his memoir. This was published in 1932. This is a short thing called Letter to My Children. This is my great-grandfather writing in the 1920s. During my life and your mother's, I have, with her aid, planted 41,600 trees and more than 10,000 shrubs. Every year for over 30 years, we planted our flower garden, in which no doubt at least 10,000 beautiful flowers blossomed out annually. During all those years, every tree we planted we nourished, nourished so that it could grow, become beautiful and useful in its own way. Birds came to nest in them. When autumn came, their leaves fell to the ground, covering over all with a sheltering mantle. The trees are all now tall and beautiful. We are glad and satisfied with what we have tried to do for them. He continues, When I was young, seven, in 1869, I helped my father to break up the primeval forest and prairie so as to make new land for grain and corn. I remember to this day the thousands of trees, young and old, yes, more than the 41,600 that we grubbed up, chopped off, and burned except those that had straight trunks from which fence posts and, and firewood were made. The breaking plow pulled by two horses and two oxen turned down all the beautiful small shrubs in what was left of the tree forest. The breaking plow turned down far more than the 150,000 flowers that we have since planted in our flower beds. All the trees, shrubs, and prairie flowers that grew in the woods and on the prairie were turned down and destroyed. Not one now grows on the new land that we made. Not one. You ask me now why your mother and I are planting so many trees, shrubs, and flowers each spring. Because we want to replace what we destroyed. That is why. My grandfather, my great-grandfather was a incredible inspiration to me, as you can imagine. This is someone who like myself, had an immense appreciation for the natural world and a feeling of, of, of success of feeding people from his farm. Uh, his curiosity, his compassion, his humility, above all else, comes down to me through this writing. Because what else would it be but humility that would cause this man to devote so much of his life to planting trees? What would cause him to feel such a need to give back to nature, if not a sense that his own role in the big order of things was tiny, his own understanding about the complexities of the natural world, trivial in the final analysis. My great-grandfather could never have envisioned what has come to pass in agriculture since his death, for better or for worse. He could never have envisioned this. But he did not require proof of the extent of the soil loss going on in the farm uh, to, uh, to, to know that, that, that planting trees was the right thing to do. He didn't need that proof. He didn't need that that clear uh, calculus in front of him. He didn't even know about climate change, but he planted those trees. He just knew that regardless of the incompleteness of his vision of a sustainable future, that just planting those trees was simply the right thing to do. And so this is my call to you on this Earth Day. Do not be overwhelmed by the extent of the problems that we face. Do not let the skeptics discourage you in your idealism. 
have the courage and the imagination to think about alternatives to business as usual in everything that you do. Become a community gardener or a tree, or a tree planter, a bicycler or an avid recycler. Not because you calculate just the impact of what you're doing and its value in the world. Do it because, like my great-grandfather, you understand that it's the right thing to do. Because you understand that nothing less than a full community commitment to the solving these problems of organic, or excuse me, of environmental sustainability will work. That it takes a community of people all working together using their own skills and their own ways to solve these challenges that face us, to confront them in a meaningful way that produces long-term sustainability. We need to get started on this right now, and we need to do whatever we can together to take this on. Thank you very much. So I am happy to take questions. I think I got her in, in, in time here. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, clarify things that perhaps I move quickly. And, and uh, you have questions uh, of one sort or another. I'm very happy to, uh, to take those questions if you have them. Yes? How do you take care of the soil after you've grown these perennials for like two or three years? Right. The question is how we prepare soil, how we turn from a perennial system <coughs> excuse me, back into an annual system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, at this point, we're doing it with heavy tillage. You know, we come in there and we're undoing a lot of what we're doing with a big 130 horsepower tractor and a big chisel plow. Um, there are big downsides to it. Again, that's that very tension right there. You know, uh, I believe uh, that uh, you know, if we really looked at this and did that calculus long term, we would see that that those three years of, of in, in the winters and so forth. I mean, we're still contributing back a great deal uh, through those perennial crops. Uh, some of it is then lost. You know, there is some some uh, some loss over the course of time when we're when we're making that ground black in the summer and planting vegetables and cultivating and so forth. But I think in the in the final analysis, um, there is uh, like uh, John Foley's farm, his brother's farm in Maine suggests there is a net gain of uh, and it can be very very significant, in both in organic matter and uh, and all of the benefits that that brings with it. Questions. Compact soil. I saw you had that cute little. Oh, sorry, sorry. <coughs> I saw you had that cute little tractor. Um, do you use some of the large ones that, you know, do have issues with compacting soil as well? Oh yes, we certainly do. Absolutely, we have, uh, you know, everything from that little electric tractor, which is about a 15 horsepower thing, right up to 130 horsepower fieldwork tractors. And uh, those tractors have, uh, uh, they allow us to do wonderful things in some ways, remarkable things. Uh, they have, there's a very great downside to that though, not just uh, the pollution, the, the sourcing of the, the fuels and so forth, but as you say, compaction and impact on soils. Again, uh, what, we're, what I'm talking about, I think you've heard me mention it many times, is that, that tension between the, the need to get in there and, and work down that cover crop, make a, a clean seed bed that we can get very, very small carrots to come up in an even stand and grow uh, evenly uh, to the point where we can harvest them and, 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 and produce calories and, and satisfy our markets. Uh, there's a great tension in there. Um, I do believe, ultimately, I have, I have, again, I take it as an article of faith that uh, as, as we find ways to, to, to find different sources of energy for those tractors and, and practice this soil rotate, this crop building rotation that I'm talking about that does include, again, not only perennial cover crops, but also annual cover crops that we're putting in and biannual cover crops that we're putting in um, between growing seasons and spring, fall, off, off, off times of year. Um, that in general, uh, we will be able to um, reverse this tide of, of, of soil degradation and, and build organic matter and build uh, fertility and, and long-term uh, soil health over time. Uh, but uh, again, uh, every time we take that big Ford tractor across the field, even with the big duels that, that distribute the weight and, and put less pressure on there, it's, it's a very destructive thing. What kind of batteries are in your electric tractor? And what, what is your challenge with hydrogen-powered fuel cells? Uh, the, 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 right now, we just uh, <clears throat> we put that little electric tractor together again, um, uh, put it together uh, out of a, a, an electric motor kit and a, and a tie-in to the, the uh, bell housing there that, that, um, that was commercially available. And it's just powered by lead, conventional lead, deep cycle lead acid batteries. Um, you know, the weight is really a good thing for those tractors, again, to give them ballast and so forth. 
Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, hope that uh, obviously that battery technology will improve over time and that we can look at other, at other types of, uh, of systems in time, but uh, uh, right now we're just using the one lead, lead acid situation. Um, I, you know, again, I, I, I would love to think that hydrogen fuel cells over time would, would be able to provide enough uh, tr uh, uh, torque and, and uh, a power to, uh, to run uh, uh, the truck that, that Mike drives to, to Minneapolis or will be driving to Minneapolis this summer delivering our produce or, or the big 130 horsepower Ford tractor that I talked about. Uh, but um, again, I'm not holding my breath. I, I, I think those things might be a ways out in the future and uh, I think it's important to get started on, on uh, alternatives right now even within our, own, within our own farm rather than relying on, on, on something like that out in the future. I'm hopeful, uh, but uh, I feel like it, it, just hoping for uh, someone else to solve the problem for, it is really, uh, for, problem for us is not really a good option. Uh, for students who are here and for those of us who work with students, um, when I was a student, I found all this stuff so compelling and then I felt like, because I wasn't from a farm family, I just didn't see a pathway to doing this. So you could say that I got a PhD because I couldn't figure out how to make it as a farmer. <laughs> um, what do you suggest? Do you feel that? You've obviously got that strong family connection. What are some other paths? Lots of our students do have a family connection too. That might work for them, but I'm mm -hmm. curious about your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, I'll just tell my own story. You know, yes, I had a, a great grandfather who, uh, who farmed and, and my, my grandparents obviously both grew up on farms. But they moved to Red Wing, into the town of Red Wing, when they were uh, uh, young adults. And, and um, so my family is uh, two generations removed from uh, a farm. And the, the, the land has all left our family years ago. And here I am, 120 miles down, down, down river. Uh, I did not grow, I grew up in, in more or less in suburbia. and knew nothing about agriculture and was going to heading for a life of academia myself. Uh, but uh, again, you know, as a student, I just felt like any honest look at the problems of this world were so overwhelming, you know, that, that, that I needed to feel like I was part of the solution, um, uh, you know, working on building something up rather than just tearing something down intellectually or, or, uh, or, or academically in some way. And uh, so I just took a farm job and coming out of my, my, my junior year of college, I just decided I'm just going to try this thing and uh, I was hooked right away, right away. And uh, 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 I went back at, right after my senior year of college. I got a social science degree. I didn't really have any training in any of this. Um, but I had many things going for me. Number one, I had very supportive family. Number two, I didn't have any debt. And that's the, uh, uh, the important thing there. Um, and uh, I also had a wife and, and family that were willing, you know, that, that were uh, uh, willing to tolerate me living very um, uh, inexpensively and sort of on, on the edge for a lot of years as we were building up our, as I was working first of all and for other farms. Uh, and, uh, and building up the experience and, and the, um, the knowledge I needed to go out into business on my own. You know, I, we lived, you know, we didn't live high on the hog for a lot of years. And, um, you know, uh, my family supported that, my wife supported that, and uh, we are, I was just very lucky that way. That was at a time in which, you know, again, in the, in the eight, late 80s, early 90s, when there was not a lot of consciousness about organic food. One thing has changed, and, and very dramatically and, and positively here, I think, is that there's a lot greater consciousness in, the, in, 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 in culture in general about the importance of local and sustainable food systems and therefore a lot greater demand for produce. And so therefore, uh, even though there are more farms, I just feel like there's more opportunity still day by day uh, to get into this sort of thing, to come to work for a farm like ours. We, we employ dozens and dozens of people. And, um, we, uh, and, and farms like ours employ many people and, and we, we, we don't pay great wages because we're still recovering from flooding. But, um, you know, uh, some farms are, are paying a, a reasonable amount of money and are very profitable and are a good model and, and there's every opportunity to get into it um, if you have, again, a, a sense of that dedication and, and creativity and the ability to, uh, uh, to, to imagine something, uh, an alternative, and, and devote yourself to it. So I encourage you to, uh, to, uh, to pursue it, you know, whether, again, whether you're a, a home gardener or a, uh, a, a, an aspiring commercial um, truck farmer like myself. Uh, there's a range of ways to get into this, and there's no reason why, um, uh, 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 you know, you have to feel as though the doors are closed in any way. You mentioned... Uh 
or showed using some beef, have you done anything with like some poultry or sheep or goats or so much to process some of that cover crop and to convert it more organically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, this is a great question about how, uh, uh, you know, how uh, livestock can be used in that, in that fertility cycle to, uh, to, to convert uh, uh, biomass into fertility and to, and to build soil in that way. Uh, we are, I think uh, the slide that I put up there, you know, we're, 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 we're dipping our toe back into that pond. We did have chickens and, uh, and, 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 and hogs in particular for a number of years before the flood. Uh, but uh, the, the flood uh, was such a, uh, it just turned everything on its head for us and, and uh, we just focused down and, and drilled down on, on getting our vegetable uh, rotation better and, and our vegetable production practices better coming out of that. So it's been a number of years since we've had livestock like that. I see them as an indispensable part of the system, you know, again. Um, the fact that, you know, in this day and age, you know, we're so specialized in agriculture where, you know, we tend to produce all the poultry in Pennsylvania and all the, the hogs in Iowa and uh, uh, concentrating, uh, uh, you know, these various aspects of, of, of agriculture in certain areas where manure becomes a liability rather than an asset, you know, th th we have to have diver and again, uh, the very notion of sustainability has got to include diversity, not just of, of uh, a flora, perennial and annual crops, but also getting the fauna reintroduced and, um, and, and, a, and a healthier system of that sort. We're moving that direction. I'm sure hoping that within a few weeks we'll have some chickens and some pigs out on this new farm on the ridge that I showed you, that, that aerial map there. That's going to give us an opportunity. There are some buildings up there. We could, we could, um, we could get some chickens and some, some, uh, some others that pasture poultry and, and cattle and livestock in particular. Um, if we felt like we could contain them, if we were good fencers, we might get some sheep, but uh, boy, they're hard to, hard to keep, keep them to stay put there, in my experience with it. Uh, you know, I, it, it's better to, easier to get a tomato plant. You just put it in the field and it stays there, you know. <laughs> so uh, the sheep are a tough one. You know, I, we, may get it, we may go that way, but we've got to get really good at fencing before we, before we go that particular route. Um, I work at the Whitney Center. I'm a student here. Um, and as you probably know, we feed thousands of students multiple times a week. Um, I was just curious as to um, your thoughts on like big food distribution like that and if you would ever get involved in that or maybe some of your hesitations with a system like that. Oh, people, you know, people have got to eat, and, and, the, and, and of course, uh, when I was a student, I ate uh, you know, dining hall food all the time, and uh, I wish it could have been uh, uh, from uh, more uh, regional or more sustainable sources. I have no problem at all with the idea of, of, of uh, you know, the Cisco or, or, or other uh, uh, systems of that sort uh, getting into and, and supporting what we're doing. I think that's only for the good. We've talked at length uh, uh, for a couple of years with school district here in La Crosse, actually, the, the public school system in La Crosse and, and throughout the Twin Cities metro and so forth. The difficulty is getting into that, these sort of places. Not that we don't, I mean, we have, uh, last year we put up 70,000 pounds of carrots in the month of October. That'd be enough for many school systems statewide, you know, to offer carrot sticks on, on um, winter uh, food trays months and months and months of the year. You know, we have the food. The problem is we have a food system, you know, um, within food service, uh, whether it's at, at your center here or school districts or whatever, people don't have knives. You know, you go into a school kitchen, they don't even have knives in there. You know, much less, um, you know, any process for, for peeling carrots and, and, and cutting them and then, and then uh, and, and, and serving them. You know, everything comes in, in shrink wrap bags and, and pre-chopped uh, ca uh, cabbage for, for coleslaw. You know, we, we have, you know, we're producing, again, off of, the organic system is so productive. You know, 15 stinking acres of cabbage. We have semi-trailers of cabbage off of 15 acres. We could keep the entire city of La Crosse fed in coleslaw for 10 months of the year. <laughs> easily. Easily. But nobody cuts coleslaw anymore. Everybody buys it in shrink wrap bags. You know, there, it, it, we have to change the whole way of, of, of using food in this country. You know, and that's where you can come in. You don't have to be farmers. You know, if you can go in there and say, look, we, let's get a cabbage shredder in here into, our, into, into the food service so that we can get some fresh cabbage in here from a local supplier and make cabbage in the month of April because it's every bit as good as, as it is in July. Um, I'm a volunteer with the Farm to School program here in La Crosse County. 
Uh, just kind of going off of her question with food systems, have you ever, I don't know if there's a, a, food, a farm to school program or anything in Minnesota in the county where your farm is located. I know that it's a program that's spreading across the country. Have you ever um, talked to anyone about that or heard anything about anything like that? Cropping oh, up? yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Again, I, I, I think these, <coughs> excuse me, I had a series of meetings with people last spring, you know, in, in school districts, I think, which, again, if I understand you correctly, the idea of getting local and regional foods into school systems, is that what you're talking about, onto school lunch menus and so forth? Yeah, I, 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 we've, I, I had a number of meetings, and quite frankly, it, it came to naught uh, uh, for two reasons. One is, you know, this question of processing, that these, n nobody is used to bringing in fresh carrots or fresh cabbage or um, onions that you actually have to cut up. You know, they're all used to either frozen or shrink-wrapped of one sort or another. That's a big issue. Another big issue is predictability because, you know, these people are setting up menus two, three, four, five months in advance, you know, for what's going to be served on the menu on September 10th. Well, we, we could probably, you know, there's a 95% chance we'd have great broccoli on September 10th or October 10th or, or, or even November 10th, right? But there's not a 100% chance that we're going to have broccoli on those days because unlike the Salinas Valley, we have weather here in Minnesota. And, you know, if it's, if it's been heavy rain or if it's been particularly cold or if we had a hot spell and, and three plantings of broccoli have all come on and, and we have uh, 20 pallets of broccoli one week and one pallet the next, we can't always guarantee that product when a food system needs it, like a school district, right? This is the problem. We're so used to predictability and just um, a kind of a, a factory mentality in our food system, you know, that, that, that just produced and it shows up right when the invoice says it ought to show up. And, uh, and, you, and there's, no, there's no flexibility for that. You know, for me saying to the, the, this very lacrosse, the, the director of the food system here in La Crosse, uh, 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 that, um, that yeah, I, I, there's a 95% chance we have that broccoli for you on September 10th, but I can't say 100%. She can't put it on her menu. So I, I'd really like to see opportunities like this grow, but again, the changes have to come not just merely from the production end, but from the demand end, you know, and, and more flexibility in terms of how we uh, use food.